Uh, This morning, I'd like you to take your Bibles. Uh, If you haven't got one, there's a stack of them in the back on that table back there. And I'd like you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5, where we have been looking at the importance of the Spirit-filled life for quite a while. And last couple weeks, uh, we've been looking at the foundation of the Spirit-filled life uh, as taking place in the family and in the church and And we've seen that uh, as Christians are controlled and directed and filled by God's Spirit, they form families which form churches which impact our world in in a powerful way. And for the past two weeks, we've been looking at the power and prominence of marriage in the family. And that whole web of human relationships that uh, is in the family and... uh, As we go through Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to see that that speaks of Christ's relationship with His church. It's a little microcosm of what God hopes to accomplish in this world through His bride, the church. Now, last week, uh, probably for most of us, that was a fairly alarming message. To realize how Satan can actually imitate what God does, and can actually use it for his own evil purposes. And if that message alarmed you uh, and caused you discomfort and alarm about the direction of our society, nation, and world as to what is going on, I make no apologies. Because you and I as Christians are really the true counterculture, aren't we? Our purpose is is to see our lost, dying world, and that includes the Muslim world as well as every other unbeliever in the world. Our desire is to see them come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and not just uh, (coughs) gain world prominence, but to gain eternal deliverance. We're not just after this world. We're populating the world to come. You and I have a message of good news to a bad news world. Not just that we want to take over the world, but that we want to see the world come to know the true Savior, and when He reigns, they will reign with Him. That's the power of the Gospel. It's an eternal change. It's not just a temporary, political, or national, or societal change that takes place. So we are the true, uh, I guess you could call us the true counterculture. We're the true radicals, the true rebels, the true uh, radical Christians, I guess you could say, because we love God and we love Christ and we believe the Word of God and we don't buy into whatever the world happens to be selling at the time. And because of the indwelling Spirit, we have the power to live counter-world. In fact, Ephesians 3.20 says that We can do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. We're not bound by what's going on in the world, neither do we need to fear it. We don't need to really worry about it because we've got the true message of that counters what's going on in this world. When men come to Christ, it really doesn't really matter what happens to them in this world. That's why... Uh, That gospel conference is called Undaunted. We're undaunted by what's going on in the world. We're not, uh, we know what's going on in the world, but we are to be anxious for nothing because we're undaunted. We're counterculture. We're eternally countercultural. That's the thing we need to get cemented in our brains. We are light in this present darkness. That's a powerful thing. And that's particularly true in relationships as we're going to see in the last two chapters of Ephesians. Now, this morning I want to get into the particulars of family relationships or just kind of begin to get into it. And in particular, the role of the wife. And you ladies are going, why do you always start with us? Well, that's because the Apostle Paul starts with you. Okay? And Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, starts with the wives. 
But keep in mind, ladies, he has many more verses that apply to the husbands. So guess what? We'll spend a lot of time talking to the men too. So I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 22 through 24. And keep in mind, this is, this is the extension of the Spirit-filled life. We're told not to get drunk with wine. We saw that was associated with pagan false worship. Uh, when you got drunk or went to the temple and uh, had relationships with a temple priestess or whatever, uh, you were worshiping God. But he says that's false worship. It's asotia. It cannot save. And he says, uh, be filled with the Spirit. And then he said, Spirit-filled people are those who are worshiping. There are those who are filled with thanksgiving. There are those who are mutually submissive to one another. And then he says, wives. It's just like it's just a continuation. In the Greek text, it was just a continuous text. And so he says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as unto the Lord. And the The word subject is not in there, but it's understood from verse 21. He says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Now we're going to spend a couple weeks in this passage talking to you wives, and it's going to be a great time. Now, simply put in the context, the Apostle is telling us that Spirit-filled women... Uh, a spirit-filled woman who is married submits herself to the headship and leadership of her own husband, and she submits herself to her husband as she would submit herself to the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Now, as we've seen in past studies, all successful godly, godly relationships are built on the principle of authority and submission. Without authority and submission, you can have no relationship. It just doesn't work. You can't have two CEOs running each other. Uh, It it, it just doesn't work. 1 Corinthians 11.3 really lays it out when it says, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. That's an interesting thing. Even in the Trinity, God is the head of Christ because uh, this has nothing to do with equality. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent. Only it's the passion of the Son and the Spirit to carry out the will of the Father, and the Spirit's will is to carry out the, the will of the Father and the Son. There's a mutual submission in the Trinity, although they are all one and the same. Co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent. And it's the same uh, with men and women. They are spiritual equals. Galatians 3.28 tells us that there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, but we're all one in Christ. And as a man leads his home subject to Christ, his wife is to follow his lead subject to him. That's God's divine order for the home. And God's the architect of the home. He invented marriage. He invented Adam and Eve. He invented you. (laughs) He's our creator, right? And that's how he said it's to be done. That's how it's to be carried out. And next week we'll look at uh, the fact that, you know, a lot of people might be thinking, well, you know, Paul was writing to a culture and all these people were just wonderful and they really exalted and thought marriage was cool and he was just, uh, you know, basically reiterating what was going on in the culture. That is absolutely not true. As we're going to see next time, you'll be appalled at the condition of that culture even as you're appalled at the, uh, our culture today and how it's going. That's why Christianity is so contra-cultural. It's so different from the world. It's like night and day. It's like light and darkness. It's like evil and righteousness. And we're going to see that as we go through this. But uh, just as the Trinity are equals... So husband and wife are spiritual equals. But God has given a different role and responsibility to each one. Now, uh, we've seen in the last few weeks uh, the word submission is hupatasso. And uh, we've seen that it means to line up under, or it's an old military term, and it pictures a platoon, mar- mar- pl- platoon 
marching in step with one another behind the leadership of um, the platoon leader, in this case, Christ. And that's the picture we have here, isn't it? Verse 21 says that uh, all believers are to be mutually submissive to one another. And how that works in the family is that husbands are submissive to Christ. Wives are submissive to the leadership of their husbands. And, and children are subject to the godly leadership of their parents. Again, that's God's stated order of things. Now, while we're even stating that, we need to remember, while we're talking about that, the, 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 how God defines leadership. In Matthew chapter 20, you know, they're, they're talking about we want the right and left-hand seats of the kingdom, John and James, and they put their mother up to it. And uh, all the other disciples were upset because they got there first and asked for those prominent positions. And, and Jesus says, you know, you don't understand uh, leadership. You know, the Gentiles, the great men exercise leadership over them, and they, you know, they put people in subjection. He says, not so among you. He says, the greatest among you should be your servant. Wow, the greatest. The greatest husband is the one who serves his wife. The greatest wife is the one who serves her husband and her children. Uh, the greatest children are those who serve their parents. The greatest Christian is those who serve in the body of Christ. That's what he's saying. He says, first among you shall be your slave. And he says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And if anybody deserved to be served, it was Christ. If anybody should have been put on a throne and carried around on the shoulders of men, it was Christ. But he came to serve. In fact, he came to serve to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's our example of leadership. And that, folks, is so contra-cultural it's almost impossible to understand without the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. It's so countercultural, isn't it? Where male chauvinism and domination of the fair sex on the one hand and feminism and uh, the women's lib uh, movement, gender equality and homosexuality and lesbianism and transvestitism and divorce and abortion and all sorts of social evils have both perverted and sought to destroy the family, something that God has lifted up as sacred. You know, it's interesting, this uh, week Sandy and I went over with Dave and Di and uh, Dave's uh, two brothers and their wives to celebrate, well, they, they just went over for the sunshine, but uh, we went over to celebrate our 42nd anniversary, and that was really exciting, but... Uh, we went to San Luis Obispo Thursday night because they have their uh, farmer's market. It starts at 6.30 and it goes to who knows how long. Uh, and we're walking along and there's all these barbecues and uh, there's some really cool things going on over there. You ought to go over there sometime. But uh, anyway, we come by this booth and it's called the Gender Equality Booth. And there's a few young girls there and uh, from the San Luis Obispo, and, and uh, we're, we're walking along, and Dave and I, being who we are, couldn't resist. <clears throat> so we go over and uh, talk to them, and they're promoting this play. I can't even tell you what the name of the play was because it's so gross. It just gross you out, and I, I, you'd probably fire me if I, I told you what the title of it was. But we talked about him, and I went over to the one girl, and I said, you know, I'm a pastor, and I'm just starting to preach on marriage and the family and uh, in the book of Ephesians. And I said, you know, God really exalts the role of women. In fact, God, Christ, raised women back to the level they were given at the creation. It's a marvelous thing. Do you guys believe in marriage and the family? So this one girl, she like, oh, oh, uh, so she calls another girl over. And I go through the whole spiel again, and she was totally uncommitted. She would not make a declarative sentence about marriage and the family, whether yay or nay. And uh, finally just said, you know, you know what the scripture says about the role of women? I said, it exalts it. It exalts it. 
being a wife. It exalts being a mother. It exalts a person who is willing to pour their life into the next generation and raise them up as godly individuals and so on and so forth. I said, it's the greatest role on earth. And she was like, oh. And anyway, we, we finally got frustrated and left. But, uh, you know, <laughs> hopefully we planted a seed. You know, that, uh, you know, sharing the gospel. We got to share the gospel with different people. But uh, in this case, it was like, do you, do you even understand what you're doing, what you're saying? You know, this female empowerment stuff and all that stuff. Do you, do you even understand where the real empowerment comes from? From God, you know. But anyway, it was interesting. So, so believe me when I say you and I are the true, as true followers of Jesus Christ, are the new counterculture. So, girls, if you want to rock your world, you follow God's plan. Be the type of person who knows why and what marriage and the family is all about, and and has that goal to be God's woman in that context. And you will literally rock your world. They'll think you are so unusual that they'll be drawn to you and wonder why you're actually a godly woman. You know, everybody's, I think, you know, uh, I think that's particularly true of the role of the wife in our culture and society today, and even in our world, because I believe the the effects of radical feminism have made women... Even Christian women nervous about their role in the family. They're like, oh, am I giving too much? Am I, you know, am I being caged? Am I being taken advantage of? You know, they're all worried about everybody's so sensitive about their rights and whether they're getting all they deserve and whether they, they're being self-fulfilled and getting all of life that they should get out of it. And, and we forget the family is basically a service organism, not an organization, an organism because it's a living thing with living people. Uh, with very well-defined roles by which we serve one another. Because at its core, family is not about rights. It's, not, it's about responsibilities. It's, it's uh, taking on roles. It's taking on responsibilities. In order for any family to function properly, various members of that family must assume various roles and responsibilities, or it will not work. We've come up with a psychological term to describe this. We call it dysfunctional. In other words, it just doesn't function. Everybody can't be doing their own thing, leading their own life. They've got to work as a unit, right? Wives have to be wives. Husbands have to be living like husbands. Children have to be kids and following uh, you know, their, their parents' lead. And unfortunately, in some cases, they are. We have another term that we could lower it down a little more that uh, we could just say the family has been trashed in our culture today. Legislation from the the highest legislative echelons to the lowest view of family you can find, it has been trashed, attacked, marginalized, and come after in every conceivable way you can think. You and I as Christians, if we want to go against culture, we need to do it God's way. And that's what we're going to be talking about. You know, in order for any family to function properly, various members of the family must assume various roles and responsibilities. Let me illustrate this to you from the... uh, the illustration of the body of Christ. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's an amazing passage as it talks about the body of Christ. And remember, we are the bride of Christ. That's the analogy. We're the bride of Christ. Christ is the bridegroom, right? This is how we're to relate to the bride and to one another and to Christ as the bridegroom. He says, beginning in verse 4, he says, now there were varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Uh, he used the word distributions. There, there are distributions of gifts. Every one of us who knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. 
Therefore, every one of us has a spiritual gift that God wants distributed in the body. Right? He wants to use every one of us in a special, unique way because we're individuals. And then he says, and there are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. In other words, there's a different distributions of those gifts and different distributions of ministries because God will use those gifts. He will use your individuality to be a blessing to other people as you minister to them. And then he says there's distributions or varieties of effects or fruit from those various ministries. God wants to use each one of us. Uh, he says because it's the same God who works all things in all persons. And why does he do that? Well, verse 7. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The reason I'm in this church is not for me. I don't need to hear this sermon. I've studied it all week. I'm in this, you know, God has given me the gift of teaching and preaching for you. To give it to you, not for myself. He teaches me first, and then he says, pass it on. Give it away. Uh, because you're gifted in this, and he's given you this ministry, now be a blessing to others. Bear fruit. And then he says in verse 11, but the one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. God is sovereign over this whole thing. In verse 18 he says, but now God has placed the members, each one of them, each one of us, Think of us in terms them in terms of us in the body just as he desired. He says, uh, if they were all one member, where would the body be? You know, this is not the church of Bob. And I'm sure you're aware of that. This is the Oakhurst Evangelical Free Church, and each one of us is part of that body. He says, but now there are many members, but one body. We're all part of this. We're all part of God's plan and program for his church body. He says, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and, on, and our less presentable members become more presentable, whereas... Our more presentable members have no need of it, but God so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but the members may have the same care one for another. He says, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. Now, I can think of hundreds of illustrations of this. You know, I think of when we met over at the school, uh, probably 10 years ago or so now. Uh, we had a man named Jim Cummings. Great, godly man uh, in my mind, and all he did was set up chairs and run the thing. But you know what? If we walked in there on Sunday morning and there was nothing there, wouldn't have happened. He wasn't what you'd consider an upfront, prominent, teacher kind of guy, you know, uh, 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 you know, let's build the kingdom kind of guy, you know, but without that him, nothing would have happened. Same with uh, many, many, many others. But uh, on the, those members which lack, we bestow more abundant honor. In other words, we're all equals in the body of Christ, aren't we? No one's superior to another. But a lot of different things have to be done to make things happen in a, in a body. You know, my, I eat things and then things get eliminated. And what if they don't get eliminated? You're in trouble. You know, you, uh, I, mean, I mean, there's just tons and tons and tons of examples where every part of your body is important. You know, if you've got, uh, like Steve Riley, you know, uh, we lift weights together and stuff on a couple days a week. And, and uh, when he hurt his finger, you know what? Just, just hurt this one little finger. That much of his body, he can't do anything. Nothing. You know, the only thing he can do is this. 
And that's it. That's the total exercise <laughs> program. And he came over and we talked and he was sitting in a chair doing that. And I was proud of him. But, you know, uh, it, it's amazing how just, you know, like two inches, three inches of your body can incapacitate everything else. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 5. And look at verse 32. You know, he talks about wives, husbands, and do all this and so on and so forth. And he, and he says, this mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. This is all about the church right here. And Christ's relationship to the church and how we are to model the relationship Christ has with His church. He says, nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his, his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see that she respect her husband. That's the whole goal of that teaching. It's, it's really not about marriage and the family, but it is. But what it's saying is that family is a microcosm of the church. No member is more important, but each member is given a duty, a role, a responsibility to fulfill to the benefit of the entire body or to the benefit of the entire family. Not one of us lives solely for himself or for himself. Think about since the 60s, all this... Uh, Emphasis on self. It's all about you, baby. You know, what's more important than me? Self-esteem, self-fulfillment, self-actualization, self-everything. Is any wonder that the family is in the process of being destroyed? You know, when you get just a bunch of people living together in a house and they're all for themselves, you got problems. You know, when you don't have them taking on the proper roles and responsibilities and they're only thinking about self-fulfillment and self-esteem and self-me and, oh, it's all about me, baby, you got real, real serious problems. Because that's not the way it was designed by the, the designer. And when each member of the body of the f family carries out their role and responsibility, the church and the family prospers, right? Even when there's... Uh, uh, but, you know, when, when there's strife and division and people only out for themselves, there's pain and hurt and dysfunction and splits in churches and divorces and splits in marriages. You know, is it any wonder with the emphasis on self that we have placed in our society, say, in the last 40 years, that marriage is on the rocks, family is on the rocks, and in because of that, our entire nation is on the rocks. And because of that, our entire world is on the rocks. And that's what we were bringing out last week. It's sad to see. So in the coming weeks, we want to look at what marriage can be. And when spirit-filled men and spirit-filled women and spirit-filled children commit themselves to the roles and responsibilities that God lays out for them in His Word we see the true culture that God wanted to develop in this world through redeemed men and women. And this morning, as I said, we're, we're going to begin by looking at the role of God that God has entrusted to the wife. And we'll just begin looking at that. Look at verse 22 again. He says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. And you notice the be subject is in italics. That's because it's a carryover from verse 21. And then he says in verse 24, But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Now, in these two verses, I want us to see two things. First of all, the scope of the wife's submission. And secondly, the spirit of the wife's submission. How far does it go? And what's the attitude uh, that's to be displayed uh, as we exercise this quality? And, and we'll see that next time, uh, the second part. Mainly, we'll look at a little bit today, but uh, in, in the two verses I just read, there are two people in a married woman's life she is commanded to line up under or be submissive or subject to, the Lord and her own husband. Notice, every time it says, be submissive to your own husband. Not all men, but your own husband. And if she's walking close to the first, the Lord, she usually won't have a problem with the second, the husband. This is part of the mutual submission we talked about in verse 21. Now, 
Notice, first of all, this passage is not teaching the universal subjection and inferiority of women to men, as some cultures do. Women in the ancient world, as we're going to see next week, were thought of as no more than property. To be used and abused, to keep in your house, to make you legal, to have legal children, that kind of thing. But your real goal was to go out and have as much fun as you could with other women. Uh, Very similar to our society, by the way. Um, But we'll talk about that next time. But uh, women are not slaves or property of men. The Word of God simply states that we, that to have a godly, harmonious marriage, the wife must assume a role and a position of submission to the will of God and to her own husband, to Christ and her own husband. Why? Because that's what God says is the proper order of things. That's what the divine architect designed and how he designed marriage to work. And that's how it does work. I can attest to that after 42 years. That's the way it works. It not only is a great concept, it is a great reality. Because that's the way it works. You know, and and I'm I'm not just a pragmatist, but, you know, after 40 some years of being a Christian, you know, I've applied God's Word in many areas of life. Some areas I haven't applied so good, but in the many areas that I have applied it, you know what? It's true. It works. That's the way things are. You know, violate it and you suffer the consequences. Believe it and put it into practice and it works. You know, and we're not pragmatists, but what God says works. Because He designed it. Who invented marriage? Us? Well, if you, you descended from an ape or something, maybe you did. You probably still act like an ape, but... Um, you know, that, that, that's not the deal. We look into God's Word and we do what He says and it works. Now, first of all, like every true Christian, Christ is to be her life as she submits uh, to Him and to her husband. Uh, her husband is not her life. Her kids are not her life. Her career is not her life. Her house cleaning <laughs> is not her life. But the Lord. She is to love Christ with all her What? Heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? That's where it starts. That's the first commandment. And that's the first area of obedience. And out of her love and obedience to Christ, she willingly lines up with her husband. She willingly follows his lead. She willingly serves her family. Say, but you don't know my husband. In fact, you don't know my family. (laughs) Uh, Are you kidding me? Turn to 1 Peter 3. I want to make a point here that I think applies to every one of us, no matter what our situation, but particularly in this case applies to uh, marriage and family. Peter starts by saying uh, in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, In the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands. Again, he emphasizes your own husbands. In the same way, what's he saying there? Well, he's driving us back into the text, right? Backwards. Same way as what? Well, same way as verse 13 of chapter 2. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as one in authority or to governors. And you know who they're talking about here? Nero. Nero would end up having Peter crucified. But he was still to submit to the rule of Nero. He says, uh, verse 15, for such is the will of God. Verse 17, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Honor Nero, are you crazy? (laughs) He says uh, in verse 20, but if when you do, he says uh, in verse 18, servants be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only those who are good and gentle, but to those who are unreasonable. The word is scolios, crooked. Serve a crooked master, yeah. Don't get involved in his crookedness, but serve him where you can. Then in verse 20 he says, but if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. 
And then he lifts Christ up as our ultimate example. He says in verse 21, For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps. And then he says, In the same way, you wives. He says, Be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the Word, He says, they may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a counseling session and the wife wants to dump her husband simply because he's disobedient to the word. Okay? He just doesn't have the same spiritual desire I have. He just doesn't want to do it my way. He just doesn't, you know, he's just not the guy he should be. And he says, how? He says that they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses or spending all your husband's money. (laughs) He says, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with an imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way in former times... The holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And if you know anything about Sarah and Abraham, um, that must have been difficult. Must have been difficult. And you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Interesting comment after mentioning Sarah and Abraham. Because there's plenty to fear when you're around that guy. If you know the story. Now, tell me ladies, who's this woman really submissive to? God, right? I mean, she's really submissive to God. Okay? She's set on obeying and honoring God. And how far does she carry this submission to her husband? Well, I believe the scope of her submission is a willingness to get in line, to get behind someone else, her husband, to serve, support, encourage, and love them, often in spite of how they treat or relate to you. Even in the case of a sinning, disobedient husband, verse 1. Or take the example of Abraham. Twice he gets Sarah thrown into various lusty king's harems she gives him her maid to produce children through and not only produces a child but but uh you know a love affair that had to be nipped in the bud um you know just all kinds of problems they went through and so on and so forth but she was still obedient to her husband because their behavior does not change how you are to conduct yourself And I'll say the same thing to the husbands later on. The submissive wife is dead set on honoring Jesus Christ in her life, so much so that even having a spiritually disobedient husband, verse 1, does not mar her relationship with her Lord. She remains chaste and respectful, verse 2. She cultivates the inner person. She has the eternal quality of of a gentle and quiet spirit, verse 4. And she has adorned herself with both physically, emotionally, and spiritually With the Word of God, verse 5, she fearlessly does what is right in God's eyes, verse 6. Trusting Him all the while. And I'm talking about God. And being submissive to her husband. That's a godly woman. She weighs her words. She prays. She trusts God. She honors Christ. She honors her husband by uh, her adornment, her words her actions, and all that despite the way her husband may be living in many cases. That's a tough thing to deal with, isn't it? You know, I was counseling a couple once, and the wife said, never forget this, I'm tired of being the only one around here who acts like a Christian. And my response was, no, no, no. That's not the the attitude. The attitude is that you have the privilege of acting like a Christian, of displaying 
true Christianity, even in this situation with a disobedient husband. You have the privilege of doing that. How else do you want to act? Like your disobedient husband? You know, that's the temptation, isn't it? You know, fire with fire. Well, you're going, you know, and jump on him with both claws. You know, we had a situation a long time ago where a guy was out committing adultery. He was confronted. And what happened? The wife went out and committed adultery. That does not solve the problem, folks. That doesn't take care of the problem. Somebody's got to act like Christ in these situations. You know, it. <laughs> you can't fight fire with fire. You see, that's why Christ always needs to be at the center of our lives. That's, that's why we need to continually be Spirit-filled because then it doesn't really matter what anybody else is doing. We can do what is right like Sarah without being frightened by any fear because God is in charge of our lives. It really doesn't matter what everybody else is doing doesn't matter what the world's going or the direction the world's going. I live my life for Christ. doesn't matter what your mate does, what your children are doing. You live for Christ. That's the point. I'm not to be, you know, ebbing and flowing like the tide with external circumstances. You know, I think where Peter got this, turn to John 21. You know, I was studying and the Lord just kind of laid this on me. (laughs) Remember the situation, Peter's denied the Lord three times and John 21, he gets restored. You know, the Lord says, Peter, do you love me? He says, yeah, I like you a lot. And he says, do you love me? And yeah, 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 I like you a lot. Tend my sheep, tend my sheep. And then he says, do you even like me a lot? He says, you know all, and Peter was grieved when he said that because he was challenging his baser form of love that he was coming back with. And he says, you know all things, you know that I love you. And the Lord accepts that. Tend my sheep. And then he says in verse 18, I love this. This is so Peter. This is so us. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, notice that grow old. He says, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. I wish the Lord would call all of us like that. You know, you're going to follow me, you may die for me, because you're going to live so contra to the world, counterculture. You're going to be saying things and believing things that most of the world doesn't believe. You're going to be espousing the truth. You're going to be living for a resurrected Christ. And and most of the world doesn't believe He rose from the dead conquering sin and death. And and so, follow me. Peter, turning around, that's the first mistake, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them and at more than likely John, we're pretty convinced it's John, the one who had leaned on, on, on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to the Lord, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? <laughs> if I'm going to die, who else is going to die? <laughs> With me, you know? Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? Well, that's pretty curt. You follow me. Okay? Don't worry about, you know, I, I love that. You know, quit worrying about how, what your husband is, how your husband is acting. Quit worrying about your, how your wife is acting. Quit worrying about what everybody else is doing and you just follow me. You know, you never fix anything by becoming the problem yourself. You know, just because somebody else is acting out and becoming a problem... You don't fix the problem by becoming the problem, right? You fix it by living contrary to the problem. You say, but but he's abusing me physically. Call the police. You have my kudos 
a man strikes you, if he's abusing you physically, call the police. 911. Don't put up with it. But if he's disobedient to the word, not living like you think he should, you'd be the kind of person that God would call you to be. Like in 1 Peter 3. So we see the scope of submission to the Lord at all times, and even when your husband is being disobedient to God and His Word, you follow Christ. Don't let His disobedience make you disobedient to Christ yourself. You say, okay, Bob, I'll be submissive. Wine, wine, snivel, snivel. I guess it's my cross to bear that that's my burden. Punishment for all the sin I've committed to stick with this jerk. Woe is me, you know, and we break out the violins. And uh, I think we're missing, we're forgetting something here, ladies. Let's wrap this up by looking for a moment at the spirit of submission. We'll just look at it for a moment. We'll talk more about it next week. But how are wives to be submissive to their husbands? Well, in verse 22 it says, as unto the Lord. And verse 24 says, But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. How are we being submissive? Well, as unto the Lord, as unto our bridegroom. Will that be painful to do? Yeah. Will that be contrary to what I want to do? Probably. (laughs) Will that go against every fiber in my being to do this? Probably. That's why you can only do it if you're spirit-filled. If you're worshiping and you're thankful and you're subject to one another in the fear of Christ. That's, otherwise, it's impossible. You'll end up hating the guy and throwing gasoline on him and burning the bed. <laughs> there was a song about that, huh? But unless you're spirit-filled, you'll never be able to do that. But tell me honestly, ladies... Uh, what would it do to your man if you actually willingly and enthusiastically went along with something he wanted to do? Not sinful, but just went along with it or fully supported the decision he wanted to make even though you thought it was the wrong decision. Not a sinful decision, just what you thought was the wrong decision. How would it affect him if you sincerely comforted and encouraged him when he messed up? What would it do for him to know without reservation that you were on his team behind him 110% instead of questioning and trying to pick apart everything he says and does? Instead of being a master manipulator of the situation. What would it do for him? You say, but there's been so much water under the bridge I've uh, been hurt too deep. You know, I thought he was the ideal, he became an ordeal, and now I want a new deal. Ideal, ordeal, new deal. Many of you have been through this whole process and some did get a new deal. Others submitted and did it God's way and restored the relationship and the marriage. I could bring up numerous examples. But let me ask you another question as we close. Is the God who reconciled the world to himself at the cross that impotent that he can't heal your situation if you're just willing to get yourself and your emotions out of the way long enough to exercise some real Christian virtue and attitudes like it talks about in 1 Peter 3. Instead of trying to control everyone and everything. You know, you and I, man or woman, we all want to control the universe. We would all like it to go exactly our way. Can't do it. We can do it God's way. Because he is the controller of the universe. What if you were willing to get yourself out of the way long enough so that Christ might live his life through you? My guess is that he could and would heal your situation. That your husband might be one without a word as he observes your chaste and respectful behavior. As he observed that gentle and quiet spirit and that deep abiding trust in God who is sovereign like Sarah. It was amazing if you read that story how he delivered Sarah. Just powerful, powerful the way that woman believed in God. That's why she's mentioned as a hero of the faith in Hebrews 11. 
She trusted God in spite of Abraham many times. She trusted God rather than be a, live a life of fear and blame. And she had plenty to fear and she had plenty to blame Abraham for. But instead she chose to trust God through the whole situation. Well, we'll pick it up here next time. and um, I'd really like you to be praying about uh, this series on marriage and the family because it is so counter what's going on in our culture today that it, it's, it's mind-boggling. But the Apostle Paul faced a similar culture in his day, both among the Jews